Welcome back to Beyond the Veil. In the last video, we talked about the difference between religion and relationship. And I know just from reports back from people who have recommended these videos to other people that this is a very hard series for a lot of people who were raised in a religi in re religious religion to kind of accept because it's it really is a, a, a situation where you have to start to question a lot of the things you've been taught and raised with and and I know that's hard for people that's that can be a very troubling thing because if you start to let go of things that you've depended upon for a long long time in order to grasp something that you're not quite sure about, but you think you want, that can be a very troubling situation. And this is this is the te this is not a test for on to salvation, eternal life. This isn't a test that if you would fail this, you know, you're you're toast or it's all over for you. That's not what this is about. But this is a time in which God is calling all people into an awakening to really be able to say, do you want this or not? Do you want me or not? Are you willing to pay the cost of knowing me? See, one of the things the church, churchianity or the religious systems tend to do is they play upon the fact that most people feel a sense of need. You know, maybe they want intimacy. Maybe they want to be healed. Uh, you know, they, they need a place to stay, whatever. They feel uncertain. They feel they're in a place where, what can I do? You know, I, I'm, I'm in trouble here. And so the institutions play upon that in the sense that they say, well, here, Come here, join this, do this, and you'll you'll have your needs met. In fact, that's one of the things Jesus noticed about the crowds who followed him after he fed the five thousand. He said, thought to himself, these people really all they want is to be fed. They want to be healed. They want a king that's going to kick out their enemies and make everything. That wonderful for him. And he did something at that point we've talked about before, but this is really important to understand. He looked at those people and he said, look, this is what you have to do. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the crowds thinned out quite a bit. See, we got this idea with Christianity that if we preach the message, all men would be drawn to it. But the message is very different than what people go to church for a lot of times. The message is that you will be persecuted. You will be have tribulation. You will undergo all of these things in the world. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring people together and to make everything wonderful. I came to actually di divide brother against brother, house against house. He said, I came. And if they persecuted me, don't think they're not going to persecute you. And the early church experienced that in great measure. Yet the church grew until it was Romanized, taken over by a political structure that then usurped the re the truth of the person and the message and gave people something most people wanted, which was security. Okay, now I've got a couple of pictures up on the board and one of them is very disturbing. <laughs> and I apologize for offending anybody because this guy is very disturbing. But I've got this picture over here and I've got this picture over here. Now. This picture of this woman with a bow and arrow and the lion in back of her is uh, my wife's 
uh, screenshot, screenshot her, her, uh, her page, her, you know, that she, when she opens up her computer and goes to do business or whatever, this is what she sees. Um, I'm sure she might now want to replace it with this one here, but I doubt it. Okay. Well, why I put this up here, and there's a story behind this picture, and when I was walking this morning, I wasn't going to do a video today, and then the Lord just impressed upon me uh, something that I needed to share. I needed to share with the, the viewers, okay, with people who would ever watch this. And it goes back to a story. When I was a young boy, we lived in a house, and uh, there would be tornadoes, um, tornado alerts on the on the TV. And so while I was watching TV, and you might see them today, a lot of people don't watch that kind of TV, but there'll be there would alert come up and say, "Tornado warning, hit, you know, take cover. The tornado's coming through." Now, when I was a little boy. We had a tornado come through. It's called the Palm Sunday tornado here. Created all kinds of destruction in our area. And you could go around the area and you could see the houses leveled, everything. And one of the things that was also happened, we lost our tree house in that day. It had only been <laughs> done two weeks. My Uncle Jim had put it up in this tree and the Palm Sunday tornado left our house, but it took down our tree house. And I was so scared about that, tornadoes at the time, that when the tornado alert came on, I would cover my hands like this and scream because I didn't want to hear that something threatening was at the door. So I would hide. Now, if a tornado came and I hid like that, would I be prepared for it? No, no way I would be prepared for it. In fact, probably if it hit our house and I wasn't in the basement, I probably would have been killed. So this was uh, not an appropriate way <laughs> to deal with the threat of the tornado. Now, over here is a picture of a woman who clearly is a warrior. She's prepared to address the enemy. This picture here, this guy, he's nowhere ready to address the enemy. He wants to hide from the enemy. This person here wants to address the enemy, fight the enemy. And then I've got some words up here that says safety over victory. See, this person uh, prizes safety above everything else. And a battle, you're... You're not safe in a battle. So this person will never have victory because they're more concerned about safety than really overcoming. And the institutional forms that this person would look for are going to, um, going to speak to that and actually uh, encourage that. You know, you go out from church, you have a bad day, whatever. You come back to church, you have a better day. So it's a constant coming and going back. How different that is from the church of the New Testament who went out. See, nowhere in Scripture, in that early part of the church, do you hear anyone saying, by the way, create a big building someplace and bring them to church. No, these people went out into a place where they might have shared Jesus with people and been persecuted. They weren't concerned about safety. They were concerned about victory. They weren't concerned about safety. They were warriors. This guy here is a coward. He, he just wants everything to turn out right. Everything, just leave me alone. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. He called us to be warriors, not to self-protect. I've got protection. This person values protection over intimacy. See, in a herd, why the herd sticks together is for protection. That they believe there's protection in herd. Well, if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. I better, if, if, if 
I don't want to be the odd sheep or whatever out, uh, and I want the protection of the herd or the church or whatever, then I better go along with what they're doing. Even if I don't necessarily agree with it, I better go along with it because that protection, that 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 form the illusion offers, that it can protect me from all of these things, that's more important than intimacy with God. Because see, intimacy in God, you may end up being like one of the prophets, speaking against the institution. And you would have no protection of the herd. You would be the odd person out. You would be the one who address something and for it were paid or stoned whatever you may be that person so you have to decide right here do you want protection or you want intimacy with the lord the prophets had intimacy with the lord the disciples all had intimacy with the lord and they considered that intimacy more important than to be protected or saved The other thing I've got down here is preservation over overcoming. See, this guy here, all he wants is to live another day. You know, I don't want that tornado to give me. Ah. So I just want to live another day. He values that more than overcoming his fear, overcoming what oppresses him. Preservation, peace, safety, all of these things is more important than overcoming. See, it's in the tribulation when you address it as she does here, that overcoming, when you value overcoming or putting the enemy's foot under the, uh, the enemy under the foot of Jesus, when you, only when you consider that more important than your own life, do you enter into the place that Jesus actually calls us to go, where we consider his mission of putting the Satan under his foot, both in our lives and in the lives of others, Once, until that becomes more important than protection, you can never really enter into being a warrior. You can never really uh, be all that God, God, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, calls you to be. You just can't. Um, that's why he says, he who is willing to lose his life will find true life. See, only by being willing to sacrifice for something that you value more than your own life will you find that life. See, that's, the, that's what's going on here. And I talk to a lot of church people, and one of the reasons why people don't like these videos that are church people, and, and again, I'm not going out and saying hammer them on the head. I had a friend call me and say, they're just not getting it and, and all that. And he went back and forth. I said, stop trying to convince them. I'm really not trying to convince anybody to see it the way I see it. If you have ears to hear or eyes to see, then see and hear. But if this is a threat to you, just turn it off. Don't watch anymore. Because, see, I'm not at all interested in browbeating people into the kingdom of God. I'm not interested in turning people like this into warriors unless they're ready to leave this life for this life. That's what this is about. That's what God's about. Now, why is all of this important? Well, one of the things that we often miss in the scriptures, and we can ask ourselves, and I, I've alluded to it in other videos, but why did God create anything in the first place? It's not like the Godhead needed to create something to be more than the Godhead is, or God is, which is everything. See, he had no need to create anything. If, if you think, oh, he's up there saying, well, I'm kind of lonely. Wish I had some people to kind of 
do things with or whatever. See, he wasn't Adam, like Adam. Well, I'm kind of lonely here. I see everybody else has somebody that's their helpmate and they have intimacy with, and I don't. It's not like Adam, okay? In fact, the scripture says in the image of Adam and Eve together do we see the reflection of God's image, which is a, could be considered a, uh, um, a indication of the Godhead. See, in that completeness in the Godhead, they don't need to do anything to be more complete. They're already everything. That God's already everything. So why did he create something? Well, what do you think? Well, I know there's one scripture that says this. It was pleased the God, God that the Son, Jesus, when he used Jesus to create the world through the spoken word, that that Son would have many brethren. So, why did God create the universe? It was to have many brethren, many warriors, many people willing to risk everything to put the enemy under his foot. That's the reason for creation. Now, don't ask me to justify it. Don't ask me to explain it. But it's what the God had decided. And when they had decided it, Jesus, through the word, was breathed out. And I believe at that point there was the blood-covered separation in parts, Father and Son, which we see on the cross. Because, see, God knew when he created free will and the and the beings he would create, specifically the angel, and he gave them absolute free will that there would be an enemy. And that enemy would come to kill, seek, and destroy. Do everything in its power to destroy God's plan of creating many brethren. And we could get into that a lot more, but hold that thought. So what is God's plan? To address that, the many brethren. And not brethren created in the power of the angels. For what is man that thou would be mindful of him, Lord, when you created him lower than the angels? Why would man be such a big deal? Well, wouldn't it be like a God who set up there and created this powerful enemy, there's this powerful enemy, and I'm going to use the weak to bound the wise, the strong, bond the strong, and the simple to confound the wise. See, God is, <laughs> is, is incredible in that he looks down at us, who he's named as his children, his sons, and he wants them in the intimacy, sitting on his lap, in that vulnerable state, he wants to use them to, what? Subdue this enemy. Much more powerful than that. What, what, a, what a story, and we get to participate in it. One final thing, I'll share with you. I, in yesterday's video, I talked about my first church experience. And it came across to me as I was thinking about this, why it disturbed me so much. See, when I went to that church experience when I was seven, uh, it's not like I didn't walk in there with no idea who Jesus was. But here's what I remember about Jesus at that time. See, my mom... Uh, was going to Grace College, or go, yeah, Grace College. She knew the Lord. She had a relationship with the Lord, not fully developed, but she believed she trusted in the Lord. Because, and she went to this Bible college, and she was trying to better her life and better things for her children. And I remember very clearly sitting on her lap 
and her reading me Bible stories and telling me about Jesus. And I remember the intimacy and the connection of those moments and those stories. See, I didn't see that at all when I went into that church. I didn't see it at all. And it struck me as something's wrong here. And as a seven-year-old, it's hard to understand what's wrong. You're just feeling something. You go from the intimacy of your mother, your head leaning against her breath like a small child climbing up into the arms of Jesus. And you go from that where you're hearing about Jesus. And Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. And I feel his love through my mom. And I go from that to a, a place where there's only 15 people in the room, same 15 people or whatever, are there every week. And a guy gets up and starts telling them they're sinners, they're going to go to hell, that God's upset with them. And there's no intimacy. There's only anger. There's only fear. There's only my two little, my little brother and sister crying. They didn't ever cry on my mom's lap when they heard about Jesus. But when they went to this church, church, that's where fear entered into them about God. Up until that point, they had no fear of God. They had no fear of Jesus. But from that point forward, they did, and they had to deal with that for a long time in their life. And so did I. I dealt with it a little bit differently because I'm a different type of person. But I'm still the person who back then had fear. But I didn't ever have fear of God. I had fear of other things. Tornadoes. Whether or not I got something right or wrong on baptism or whatever. See, all of these systems combine to create fear in you so that they can move you where they want to go. All you have to do is look around our world right now and see the fear mounting in people because we're going to have food shortages. We're going to have gas, inflation, all of these things. It's all aimed at creating fear so that they can move you where they want to move you. So we need to become aware that we're in a war. We're going to be over here, hiding under our beds, shaking like a leaf, or are we going to take up our weapons and go out into a world, not call the world into where we're at, but go out into a world with the power of the Holy Spirit in the intimacy of the Lord and share the truth even if it we're persecuted, we lose everything and we even die. Think about that. It's your choice. Now, if you're not at this point here, you're more over here than you are over here, that's okay. God's not saying, you got to be over here or you're, you're out. He's not saying that. Remember the chart I had up of uh, the conception up to the grave and the different stages. If you're more over here, not quite over here, you're just someplace on that developmental timeline. God still sees you as a son. In fact, if you don't ever come over here and you're his child, you're still going to be his son. You're just going to miss out on the glory that is reserved for you to be an overcomer. So begin to pray this. Begin to pray, God, I'm like this guy over here. All of this stuff I hear coming upon the world and things, I'm scared to death. Be honest with God. Tell him it scares the we bleep out of me. I better do that. But you know what? I trust you, and if you want me over here, bring me over here through the power of your Holy Spirit. I give myself over to you for that work, because when it's all done, I want to hear the words, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You accomplished what I gave you here. Maybe it's to just reach some one person. It, 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 see, the church is about making things big and powerful. And look, because they're competing with Hollywood. They're competing with athletics. They're trying to turn something that's spiritual into the sideshow to make their numbers so it looks like they're on the right track. No, your mission may be in many ways very small, but eternally big. So remember that and pray and enter into this place that God has for you, whatever that looks like. Until we meet again, God bless you and goodbye.